If you were a praying mantis, it would be socially acceptable to devour your mate. And if you're a honey badger, you have no regard for other animals. You don't care. If you're a panda with twins, it's normal to abandon one to take care of the other. But if humans do any of these things, we would call it wrong, unfair, or unjust. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that, but we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like here, in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. And what do these words mean for the prophets, like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them.
The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So you can, yeah. So justice is not a small thing. And I want you to keep that in perspective as we move into today and, and what we're doing. Before we do, not necessarily in way of an endorsement, but in way of recognition, we want to always honor those among us in, whom honor, with whom, in which whom honor is due. Um, this morning, one of our candidates for governor is in the room, and so we want to say um, hello to Mayor Richard Irvin for coming and hanging out with us today, and we are so glad that you're here. So glad you're here. Um, it, it always a pleasure, and so it's my opportunity to get to meet you for the first time, and so thanks for coming and joining us this morning. I want you to stand with me as we read from God's Word. We're going to Revelation chapter 7. And gang, this is the most important thing we will hear all day, is God's Word. Um, what I say is not as important as what God says. And so hopefully I echo what God is saying. What you say is not as important as what God says, so hopefully you echo what God says. So we go to Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9, and this is what we read. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne. Can we just never forget that God sits on the throne? And to the Lamb, Jesus. So God, we come into this space and we are grateful for every heart and life that is represented here. And we love each other because you've commanded us to. And our best expression of loving you is how we love each other. And so we need your help in that because we're human and we're broken and we make mistakes. And so we come and we pray the way you asked us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. We are in uh, this, the fourth week of our series, Kingdom Over Politics. And uh, whoo, this has been exciting. Uh, two more weeks to go here. And when we say Kingdom Over Politics, here's why we've chose that. Because we are taking back from politics what politics stole from the Bible. What's biblical. We live in a day and an age where God still calls us as his church to be in unity. Matter of fact, it was Jesus' final prayer. He was concerned most about our unity. And so he said, Father, make them one as you and I are one so the world will know you sent me. That that was there. We live in a day and age, though, where I believe the enemy of our soul has handed two biblical truths to the Republicans and two biblical truths to the Democrats. And it's tearing the church apart and it's time to stop it. Because politics aren't God. God is God. And so we need to let God be God. And so when we talk about marriage and sexuality and when we talk about life from womb to the tomb, that is a biblical truth, not a political truth. 
When we talk about racial justice, and when we talk about the immigrant and taking care of the poor and the orphan and the widow and the marginalized in our culture, those are not blue. Those are biblical. So we want to be a church that champions what is biblical. And so we have launched into this to discover truth. And I will tell you that this is not a conversation around gray areas. It's just not. There is black and white. It is either true or it is not. And the truth sets us free. And so wouldn't we want to know what's true? So the first week we talked about the fact that we should be civil when we talk about this, that civility is not a political word or idea. It's a kingdom idea. And we said this, your credibility only goes as far as your civility in this church. And if you cannot be civil, then you are not credible. We will learn to be adults who agree to disagree. We will learn to be adults who uh, can have mature conversations. And we will not place our identity in anything but Jesus so that our identity isn't caught up in our politics or our culture or our family of origin or any other experience that we have. But it's in Jesus. So then we don't feel personally assaulted when someone disagrees with us. First week, we talked about sexuality and marriage and holy sexuality and gender. It's not a red idea. Great conversations around that. This past week, we talked about life. And I want to say out of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, especially in a culture in which we live in, in which we think our life is our life, if you follow Jesus, then First Romans 12, 1 says that in view of God's mercy, I offer my body as a living sacrifice. Jesus said, your, your, your life is not your own. It's been bought with a price. And so I need to know what God wants me to do with my life, not what I want to do with my life. That's how we think differently. I continue to be proud of the conversations I'm hearing about. We're having civil conversations. We're not agreeing. And yet we're able to come to the table and learn and grow and hear and hopefully more led by the Holy Spirit than any other voice. But it's been amazing to hear that we can actually have conversations and still have dinner together. Because we're seeking truth to know what truth is. Our theology must not inform our world. Our, our theology must always inform our worldview, not our politics, not our family of origin, not our culture, not our experiences, our theology, what we know and believe and trust about God and who he is and his nature and his character must inform what we believe about everything else. Has to. We said that, uh, Share this quote by A.W. Pink. We cannot know his will if we're ignorant of his word. And we must not edit God's word. We must be echoers of God's word. And so this week we're talking about racial justice. And the need to see every person the way God sees them. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, if, if you will, to look through a specific lens when we're talking about racial justice. Because for some of us, it was really easy to talk about sexuality and life and yeah, I'm right with you. And then we get to this piece and it's like, we have a lot of opinions. Matter of fact, I asked you to listen to Andy Stanley's message and I got more opinions about Andy Stanley's message than mine, <laughs> which is fine. I'll send them to him. <laughs> but man, did this stir up some, some stuff within us. Here's how I want you to view as we talk about racial justice. I need you to, to think of it this way. When my kids get hurt, Right? Anybody, you had your kids get hurt and you say to them this, you're okay, you're fine. I don't know if you're trying to will they're fine, but blood's running out of their head. <laughs> they're needing stitches and you're like, you'll be fine, you'll be okay. Everything's good with you, nothing's wrong. That's how we've treated racial justice in our culture as Christians. No, no, it's, it's better than, than everybody is saying it is. We're trying to will something that isn't necessarily true because we've not taken the time to say, hey, are you hurt? You're bleeding. How can I help? Yeah. And to lean in. And may that be the posture that we come before this conversation today. May that be the posture. Now, here's what justice is. And I love this video, but let me break it down really quick for us. Living in a way is to not harm another and acting in a way is to make wrongs right. That's justice. Living in a way is to not harm another, but acting in a way is to make wrongs right. We have some wrongs that need to be right. Now, I'll say this. When I define racism for us, here's how I would define it so that we're all living in a working definition of racism. Here's my definition. And if you struggle with racism because it's not in Scripture, there's plenty of Scripture about othering, though I believe racism or, or race issue are in Scripture. There is enough about othering, and that is othering. 
putting people in a camp that God never put them in because you need to feel better about yourself. So here's the definition. Attributing to one race intrinsic superiority or valuing it above another and then treating others as undesirable or evil. That is how we would define that today. It is a history-long problem. It is a global problem, not just a black and white problem or an Asian problem or a Rwanda problem or a Jewish problem. It is a massive, global, history-long, devastating, bloody, murderous problem. For example, the Armenian genocide in Turkey in 1915, a million slaughtered Armenians. Holocaust in Germany, six million. Who knows how many tens of millions in the Soviet gulags under Stalin. The massacres in Rwanda in 1994. The Japanese slaughter of six million Chinese, Indonesians, Koreans, Filipinos, and Indo-Chinese. A litany of history-long bloodletting, all in the name of ethnicity or race. That's because humans are in rebellion against God. That's where it comes from, exalting ourselves over and against our maker. And of course, if over and against our maker, then over and against each other. That's a given. Anybody that would have the audacity not to submit to the king of kings and lord of lords would not have a problem putting someone else underneath them. We find ourselves, we find our pleasure and self-exaltation being made much of. And if I have to use my ethnicity to do that, thank you very much, I will do it. That sin of racism, that grows in the ground of pride and self-exaltation is also undermined by the good news of this gospel that we, that we ascribe to and acclaim. Here's what undermines racism. The fact that we're made in the image of God. The fact that the commandment that God gives is to love your neighbor. The fact that we're new creations, therefore new creation rises above all of it. We treat each other as such. And lastly, because the gospel of justification by grace through faith alone, meaning you did nothing to get where you are and earn what God gave you. He just gave it to you. And he does that for all of us. So we cannot put ourselves above anyone else. I want you guys to welcome a really good friend of mine, someone who is part of this church, love him dearly, have grown to love him over the course. Um, we jumped in a couple years ago to racial reconciliation together, and I want you to hear from him how we jumped into that. And then we're going to invite our racial reconciliation group onto the stage and have a conversation with you, or while you listen to get up here. Um, can you give him a huge warm welcome, Terrence? <laughs> Dump my energy drink. <laughs> I just kicked over Dave's energy drink. I wonder where he gets his power from. I thought it was Jesus until I kicked over his drink. <laughs> Good morning, Hope. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> we talking? Here's what I want um, you to hear. I, I want you to explain for the church, how we got into this, how, how we got into this um, racial reconciliation over these last couple, couple years, actually. Yeah. What led to that? What was going on in you as you and I were, were getting to know each other? Well, first, I have to tell everybody, I came into this with my own biases of Dave. I said to the first service, when I first met Dave, now what, almost four years ago, right? Dave gave me his number, said, text me, hey, we got to catch up. But Dave never replied to my text messages. <laughs> Days and weeks goes by. So I thought that he was being racist towards me because he wasn't responding. How would you say amen to that? Like you've experienced that side of... <laughs> and, then I, and then I met Hope, and then it's everybody's experience. <laughs> and then miraculously, the Lord began to speak. How many times do we get together or we meet people and we have these perspectives of them that they don't like us or they're rejecting us and I thought to Dave we were in a conversation just about some of the civil unrest and I said how cool would it be for us to get together with people of all all different perspectives far right middle far left get in the room and let's unpack this and grow together I personally believe that we as believers should be building bridges loving people back to a place of safety which is the justice as the Bible interprets it for us, right? Yeah. And so it started with our kids. We started with Hope Youth and my boys in my house. I mean, you don't know, I have 10 black and brown boys in our house. We live in Barrington. And they had a very strange experience coming, well, we had a very strange experience coming into this community. And they saw the news, they saw the comments, and they said, why are you taking us into a community with people who don't like us? 
I was crazy enough to believe that all white people were not the people who were making comments on our social media posts, right? right? Thank God for that. Because when we got our home, met Dave, and then found that Dave had a heart. First of all, let's give it up for Dave Mudd. <laughs> I don't know any man, white or black, Asian, Indian, Arab, who would be crazy enough to be obedient to God to this extent to do a series on kingdom over politics and then throw racism in the mix of it. So Dave Mudd, thank you. But then Dave decided, let's do this. And so our kids, it was Micah who said, hey, why do we have to stop doing this? Now can we do it for adults? <laughs> and so I thought, well, gloves are going to come off. And so the first few weeks, it was very interesting with all the strong perspectives. One thing that I learned in this process, and everybody's going to talk about this, I learned that I, there was a lot that I didn't know that I was holding white people accountable for that they had no idea. I had no idea that you didn't know that there was a black national anthem. I had no idea that you didn't know anything about redlining until I got into these sessions. And I was like, wow, here I am. I'm a racist. <laughs> I'm a racist. Because I, hold, I held you accountable for things that I thought that you knew. But when I got into your world, I realized it's so different than what I grew up with. Yeah. And so we begin to build bridges from there and all of us begin to grow together. It's powerful. Yeah. So here's what we're gonna do. We asked you to watch Andy Stanley's message on this human race and we're gonna unpack it. But before we do, I want you to meet the gang that meets the first and third Tuesday of every month for the past couple years. I want you to meet them. I'm gonna ask them to come forward and have a seat and we'll get rolling. Can you welcome all these gangs, guys and ladies. By the way, all these black and brown people that you see up here, these are some of my homies from the city of Chicago. Thanks for coming. So every first so and third Tuesday of the month, they travel almost two hours to come to participate in this conversation. Here, here's what we're going to do. Um, I've asked them to prepare a question because this is the group that gathers in these Tuesdays and we sit and, um, like Terrence said in the beginning, in the beginning, it was, it was deep waters, quick, very deep waters, but a trusting environment. And so what I've asked them to do is just give you their name and what they have learned or what's been the big takeaway so far in the last, and I'm asking you to keep it to one takeaway, Lori. <laughs> First service, you may have done three. So if you can keep them to one, because we want to, I want to get into this conversation. Powerful first service and excited about where this is going to go. And we do go a little long. If I see you leaving, I won't stop you, call you out, anything like that. You're able to sneak out. Um, but just real quick, and if we, Destry, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> goes, nope. <laughs> if you could just let who you are and what's been like the biggest lesson or the biggest takeaway for you through this process. Is... Yeah, you might have to turn it on. <laughs> he gave you, he gave yeah. you one that's not turned on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I'm not, you know, I'm not proficient with these microphones as these, as these <laughs> pastors are carrying on. Uh, but my name is Destry. Um, if I had to, s I had so many takeaways, I might have to do four or five. Like, no. <laughs> um, I think my greatest takeaway was, scratch that, here's what I didn't want. I didn't want the blacks in the group voicing our opinion and all of a sudden making that translate into white guilt. So going through the door, I, I didn't want that. So I, I, I know I didn't no. answer your question. but it's No, good. you did. No, you did. Really good. That's yeah. huge. Hi, good morning. My name is Sharissa, the wife to this guy here. <laughs> <laughs> And my greatest takeaway, interestingly, has been the fact that racism is not the same for everybody. Um, I'm from the Bahamas, so I'm not an African-American, but I'm a black woman. And my experiences of racism or lack thereof was very different from everyone you see here. And it was interesting to recognize that racism is not the same. And it doesn't have to be, and I don't have to accept that it is for every, the same for everybody. And wow. neither do you. That's good, Teresa. Thank you. So, 
Everybody flip on your microphones. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like I never spoke before. Um, so I would say uh, assumptions have harmful um, and hurtful and wrong conclusions a lot of times or lead to those things. And the way to overcome those assumptions is through relationships. So I say the shortest distance between two people is a conversation. And so if you want, if you're assuming something about somebody, if you assume it for too long, just reach out if you have access to do that. And you might be surprised to learn that they had no idea what you thought about them or why. Yeah, my name is Chris. And I would say that the whole, the idea that we were learning together was amazing, that we are learning together. And all the assumptions that you think you might have, for instance, Joel, I've known Joel for about four years maybe. I had no idea that Joel grew up with a black brother. I have a black brother. <laughs> um, Joel's always in Africa. I've never been to Africa. But just these things, that just from snapshot, you would think you know a person. We know nothing. And it's just been really refreshing getting to know everybody here. And it's just, it's awesome. I'm Luke. It's on. Yeah, it's Perfect. Perfect. All right, then. Um, so I think the biggest takeaway I've had was just relationship developing because, like, if I'm just sitting with black folks in proximity, I'm obviously not learning or making any change. So it's been uh, a joy and a honor and privilege to develop relationship. Uh, that's where you see uh, change happening. And I, the other thing too is like, especially in an area where we're in like the suburbs that are predominantly white, so it's hard for um, myself to like find other people that don't look like me in this area to just develop relationships with and sit in the table and eat as well and all that. So I think it's just been a great um, bridge maker and like um, getting to know even perspectives that you think like, oh, they probably believe this because this is what the media tells me. And then it's like, oh, wait, it's the exact opposite. They're more like me than I thought. So Yeah. That's a good word. Hello, everyone. My name is Bitsaida. I'm Terrence's wife. Um, uh, so, um, first thing, um, my takeaway from this experience is being a blessing to this group, um, opening our home, uh, so that everyone can be transparent and share their stories. Um, I learned so much from everyone. Um, and just to see the fruit of this, uh, gathering, uh, when Emmanuel shared his story on him coming to one of our sessions and how he had to write uh, Terrence's phone number and his lawyer's number on his arm before he came to Barrington in case he was going to get pulled over. And uh, this session just shift that perspective and shift that mindset that he had um, and basically brought that wall down. And um, that was my takeaway from this. And it was very impactful that we were able to be that blessing to this group. Awesome. Thank you. I'm Lori. And... My biggest takeaway, we, my husband and I have um, Terrence and his boys over for dinner most Wednesday nights, and when we started this group, Terrence was teaching us about cultural bilingualism, and I really couldn't wrap my head around what that meant. And he said, I want you to see them and you, and I want them to see you, themselves and you. And that happened as I got to know Angel, who is one of Micah and Emmanuel's mom. And as I got to know her, we had a... Um, a year ago, May 5th, is Micah's birthday, and we had a Cinco de Micah party, and her and I were planning it. <laughs> and as we planned this party together, I saw my exact mother heart and the exact way I would plan a party for my son in her. And I was like, that's it. That's cultural bilingualism. And then there was another story. I'm not, talking, I'm not telling another story, am I? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> um, my name is Jen, and my answers changed slightly from first service as I was thinking through this more. Um, first service, I talked more about being confronted with my white privilege and how that um, just motivated me to be intentional about um, going after being anti-racist. So that's still true, but I would also add into that that there's hope. I feel like sometimes even coming to the group, you know, some of these people come 
hour, two hour, I'm like a five to seven minute. And it was hard sometimes to get myself up and to come to group. But because um, the thought of racism and injustice and how we can never solve this problem, this is so much bigger than us. But um, being in this group, being with a group um, that are unified as believers and talking through, maybe we don't always agree, but coming together um, makes me walk away feeling that there is hope. Good word. Um, I'm Micah, and the biggest takeaway I have is probably the unity that could be created from people like from different backgrounds and with different opinions to come together and like talk through things to kind of get everyone else's perspective and to just kind of get on the same page. That's good, bro. That's good stuff. I'm Angie Mooney, and um, well, I was thrilled when I was invited because I really felt like I had a lot to share, and I had an opinion, and so I was very excited to share my opinion with the group, and I quickly learned that it was an opportunity to be a student and um, really be a good listener um, and then end up having empathy to understand others' perspectives. My name is Emmanuel Sally. Uh, when I was invited, I was like, Terrence, are you sure? Because <laughs> I am perspective. I, am, I, I have a strong feelings <laughs> and strong emotions when it comes to racism and the, the perspective of it. And I want to say that those strong emotions came to be more of a softer side of taking a square or saying this is this what it is to maybe smoothing it out and I, allowing that viewpoint of racism and the relationships that you have with people outside yourself to be more of a fluid and more of a, a loving environment versus being such a strict and um, very wow. militant viewpoint. That's good, Emmanuel. Um, uh, Joe Mazanga, it's an honor to be up here. And uh, I think I'm so grateful, Dave, for your courage to create this. And I've waited a lifetime to be in a room with these people. The courage and the, we talk about trust builds transparency and transparency builds trust. The courage of these folks that don't look like, my, look like me right now and the means we've had has just been breathtaking. And so the real connection and real community has taken place and the healing happens that way. And so I'm honored to be a part of this. Good morning, I'm Joel Honiger. Uh, just a, a Quick, I, I do have an African-American brother. A lot of people don't know that because you're newer here, but my folks foster parented and then adopted a boy from day one. Actually, he was less than 24 hours old when they had him, brought him into their home, and he's 30 now. So uh, that's probably shaped me, and probably going to Africa shaped me too. So I'm grateful for how God's given me those opportunities. So some of the things I learned in the, in the group was one, I was expecting the people who aren't like me to uh, teach me and explain a little bit all the biases I had about what their answers would be to some primary questions that we asked. And I was very surprised very early on that they didn't actually have those biases, uh, that they were biblically literate thinking people who had their own opinions and didn't just necessarily spew what mainstream media would have said that they believed. And so that made me an eager student to be a part of the conversations, so. That's good. Hi, my name is Romeo Gant. By the uh, way, it's, it's Romeo's birthday today. Yes, I got you. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's also his first time at Hope, so he, he dressed like he was going to a black church today. <laughs> Pente it's, it's Pentecostal Sunday. We are, all That's of us right. are in sin right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, let me, let me, all right. <laughs> uh, my biggest takeaway I actually go back to the scripture where it said my people perish from the lack of knowledge. Um, going back to what you were saying as far as accusations, um, a lot of times when we talking to somebody or we listening to their testimony or what they have gone through, we don't actually listen. We, we're ready to respond. And I think that was one of the biggest things that we took away because Terrence invited, well, these two, I mean, these two amazing men, they invited people that 
weren't believers, right? And some of those people, I mean, those people are not here right now at this moment, but I know what we did, we planted a seed, a positive seed. So it all started from there. So just listening to testimonials and just, just being there and not arguing with one another. We just, hey, look, you agree with that? I disagree. It's okay. We're both human, you know? And we just got to allow God to work on the next person. And once you do that work, you know, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but eventually it will happen. We just got to pray and believe. It's a good word, awesome. bro, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Angel. Um, my biggest takeaway from the group was seeing that it could be so much easier than what I thought to be able to build the bridge and to be able to formulate and th that into kind of like a clear and concise picture in my mind um, is that it takes understanding, just us being able to um, look at something from a perspective and actually want to seek to understand and not show up at the table wanting to defend ourselves or wanting to prove our own right but instead literally humbling ourselves and just seeking to understand. Um, second of all, to um, act with intentionality. It's, it hasn't been an easy sacrifice of meeting every first and third Tuesday, especially for some that drive one to two hours to get all the way up here to Barrington. Um, and give that time, you know, everyone's busy. We all have things that we have going on and some things seem much more pressing and urgent than trying to philosophize about <laughs> these concepts of the world. Um, but if we don't act with intentionality, then we won't actually get anywhere because growth is going to only happen through process right. unless that seed goes into the ground and dies and it's not going to sprout up and produce fruit and being exposed to those elements and intentionality and oversight and clipping those weeds and all of those things is what it takes to do that and then last of all um, partnering in such a way that makes it personal no matter what our experience is um, we we will always stand on the outside and say, oh, wow, that's really sad, um, until we make it personal. And there is somebody that I spoke to, uh, Ruthie, in afterwards, her husband, Josh, she explained that he's in, um, why did I just go? New Orleans, yes, and she mentioned Hurricane Katrina and doing the cleanup there, and that is a perfect example of what I mean when I say that we have to make it personal, because all of us were aware in the news that Hurricane Katrina happened. We know the amount of devastation that took place, but because it's not in front of us every day, we don't keep That's it good. top of mind awareness, and so that allows us to go on with our daily routine and ritual, not even thinking about what's happening, but when you go down there and you see the devastation, there is an empathy that rises up in us that says, I can't help but not do something. And so when we make it personal in that way, we allow God to finish that last piece for us to be able to bridge that gap. So how many of you would say that through this process of relationship and engaging the hard conversation in relationship, you've grown through this process? Okay. So I want you to see that. Now, as we dive in here, what we typically do, and, and Terrence leads this way more than I do um, and does so well at this, is we'll take what's going on in culture. Maybe it was something that happened. Maybe it was something someone said. Maybe it's a video one of us saw. And we will put it in front of everybody and process it. And, and you find out about each other in the different ways in which we process it. And so that's why I thought it'd be cool to put Andy Stanley's message, This Human Race, in front of us. So for those of you who watched it, awesome. Those of you who didn't, um, wow, I, it's disobedience. But um, <laughs> <laughs> totally messing with you. I'll, I'll recap it. But I want you to, to kind of sit in. And I want you, if you want to ask some questions after, um, make a note of those. Because we're going to try to create some time after to have some question and answer. But if you had a chance to listen to Andy's uh, message, and then Terrence, I want want you to start because you stated right off the bat you disagreed with some things that he said, um, which that's the power of this. We get to disagree. But basically, he started by quoting, um, this was a couple weeks after George Floyd, he preached this message. So this is how far back that was. Um, and he said this from um, Martin Luther King, injustice 
anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So, so that's why we engage. He said the only thing that can change our fear or perspective is experience. If our personal experience is the way forward, he asked two questions. How do people who don't look like you experience you? Or how should people who don't look like you experience you? And then he says, we're accountable to the law of Christ, where Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And he presents two ways forward. Here's what he says. One, it must not be enough to, be racist, to not be racist, but we must be anti-racist. He then says, the proximity is not friendship. Facts don't change our mind, friendships do. Our love for God is demonstrated in how we treat and love each other. So here's what I want to do, and I want more of you to weigh in on this. When you listen to that message, because we all did this three, three weeks ago, so see if you can remember back. Some of you might have refreshed, I don't know. How did you receive that message? What set well, what maybe didn't, and I'll let you start. Well, first, let me just put some, some context around the group. So you don't see everyone here today. There are definitely more women. And so women, I need you to speak up today for the women who aren't here. All right. Men look like we're dominating the stage. And there's certainly more um, people whose skin are much lighter than mine's who are part of this group that aren't here today as well. Um, but as we looked at the uh, um, Anley Stanley video, of course, there are some things that I agree with him with. Um, facts don't lie and facts aren't feelings. But when you say that every white person is fearful of a black man, I disagree. I think that there are some white men or some, some white people who do fear black men. However, that does not say that all white people are. And I think that when we start saying statements like that, that creates a division and divide that is not fact, it's not truth. And so um, in that same perspective, um, I think earlier, um, one of our members said that um, she was coping with you know, her white privilege. And I just wanna, I, I feel like the room is a bit stiff, right? Everybody needs a laxative or something. Everybody's like, what's gonna happen? <laughs> Can I free you for a moment? <laughs> white privilege is not what's bad, all right? Black privilege is not what's bad. We all have some form of privilege. I know that because now I live in Barrington and I see the house that God has blessed us with. And then I go to Haiti and Tijuana and I see a difference. So there's some form of privilege, right? Yeah. It's not having privilege. It's what we do with that privilege. That's right. So I think the statement that he made that white people, <laughs> you know, Fear, black man, I think that that's, that's, that's not 100% true. Chris, do you want to jump in on that? So I said something in the last service, but I would say, you know, with the media and the things we grew up with, if I didn't know me, I might be fearful of me too. I mean, there's things out there, right? So um, the group is not about you're right, you're wrong. It's just hearing your story. You know, what's the internal dialogue that you have? Yeah. So... Going along with what Angela said, you know, things aren't always in front of us. As an example for me, if I'm riding my bike in the uh, Forest Preserve, right? I'm riding my bike. Sunny day, it's all awesome. And then at the other end, and now, listen, I love everybody. I love all of you. <laughs> at the other end comes a white woman walking. I assume, now this is just internal dialogue. I assume she thinks she's about to get killed, okay? I'm, this is kinda, I'm joking, kind of. But I assume she thinks I'm a threat so I do all my, I can to assure her that I'm not a threat. You know, you know what I'm saying? So I'm a nice person. I'm a nice person anyway, but I kind of go overboard. It can be exhausting. So that's just an internal dialogue. You know, that's, that's all. So these are the kind of stories that we kind of understand about each other. That's all. Yeah, I'll, I'll second on that. Um, even for myself, come here, I... I, I I still battle with the concepts and the concepts, the concepts, the, con the concept of racism. I still battle with it. Um, I'm more open to, let's be honest, we here. I'm more open to white people in the city than I am in the suburbs. Uh, the ones in the city are more culturally, uh, culturally, you know, aware, aware than they are in the suburbs because you come out here, it's, you only see it yourself. Um, so, just like Chris, I used to little myself. For a long time, I used to make myself smaller because I'm 6'3", I used to be 225, but I'm still 200 pounds. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but a, a, person who, a person who's a fighter, avid athlete, uh, 
strong personality, just strong viewpoints, I would have to docile myself to make sure I'm not intimidating to others. And a lot of times when I worked in a predominantly white environment, I had to docile myself so much that I lost who I was and who I am because I'm trying to be somebody that I'm actually not and I'm afraid to be myself in my room. So now I choose that even with this exposure, this constant exposure with the group forces me to stand up and be myself and to see yourself. That's huge, man. But yes, I still struggle. <laughs> but this is the part, it's the growth process. And uh, through, through trusting myself and trusting what God presented to me in my life and what I've done has allowed me to open up and say, you know what, God forgive me for choosing to do my own route versus trusting you. And yeah. this route is trusting God. That's a good so, yeah. word. Anybody else along the lines of the message and how that set with you or any response to that? Microphone to Alex. <laughs> so this is not uh, a response to what Pastor T said, but if you saw the video, um, even if you didn't, this is, it should still make sense that there's a, uh, the narrative as we're given it, I should say, by media is there's one side, you know, preach the gospel, um, teach right things, teach truth, which is true. And then there's the other side saying, okay, we have to do this, we have to create this, we have to create this program, this policy, we have to change this, we have to do these things. Some of that is probably valid. Biblically, though, and this is the other thing about the group, and people have said it, but it, we always come back and we start with, as we should, the Bible. What does the Bible say about these things? And so your orthodoxy is right beliefs, should inform your orthopraxy, which is right practice. The other one is orthopathy, which is right feeling. So if I'm reading the Bible, there's, there's, a, there's one. <laughs> there is one proper interpretation. That's right based on God's perspective of how he wants us to live out what he says in his word. For God, justice is a verb. For God, love is a verb. My man on his phone, he has Micah 6, 8 uh, on his phone, which it says, do justice, do. It's active. So if I have the right belief, but that belief does not govern me to take action in some way, shape, or form, my orthopraxy is off. And thereby, no one even knows what my orthodoxy is. Wow. You could be perfectly right in what you think and say and do. And this is not a black or white thing. This is just how we're supposed to operate. If you don't speak truth to power or speak truth when questioned, then it doesn't really matter what you believe. Wow. If you don't do something. And in doing something, let me take the pressure off again. You don't got to be downtown picketing and, and you don't got to even campaign for office. You have to have a conversation. The shortest distance between two people is a conversation. And so what happens on news and media and social media, there's no conversations. There's just arguing, yelling your insult from this side, and they yell theirs from that side. And that's it. That's the world we live in. Until we do this. And so I think, if anything, what we can take away in a positive light from, positive light from Andy's video is that we have to do something. Yeah. I'll speak. Um, we were listening to Andy Standy, Joe and I were listening to it together, and when he said, we're, all white people are afraid of black men, I said, pause that. And I talked about who we know. And, and I'm like, I would see you guys as some of the safest men on earth now. And that's new for me. I wasn't even aware that I used to think that, but it's like, once you know them, and what An Andy Stanley said about proximity, doesn't change it. It's a relationship. It's knowing you. It's seeing you every week. It's like you are one of the safest men I know. I think, oh, I think the learning, the learning is. Someone needs to sit down. We're going to add one. Is that all right? That's, everyone, this is Emmanuel's daughter. <laughs> What's exciting is, is uh, picking up what Lori said, transfer, transformation occurs in community. If you think about, uh, there's an opportunity to, I have racist views. I was born in this community. I was raised here. People look just like me. 
and I picked up every, all the conscious and unconscious biases. So imagine never having a, I've waited my lifetime, a lifetime to be in a room where I could ask those questions, not be shot down, and even hear their biases and their prejudices. That's where healing occurs. That's entering in, that's doing the work. That's good. That's good. So, did you wanna, cause I, I feel like you wanna say something. <laughs> you do, so I want you, to, I want you to weigh in there. Um, first off, my name is Anjali Sally. I am Emmanuel's daughter. Um, this is my first time here, and even though I've heard a bunch of the group by my father, this is my first time actually talking about it. So, um, what I wanted to say is, um, when I was younger, I grew up in a diverse, you can say diverse school, but soon as I went from middle school to high school, I went to a predominantly black school. When I experienced, back then I experienced, I was culturally experienced, I was culturally aware, I was aware of Asian, African, Indian cultures, but when I hit into the predominantly black school, I realized I was too cultured to be known. I was too, um, how do I say this? <laughs> I was too outcasted. I was weird, I was, cool. I was considered weird because of what my interests were compared to their interests. Wow. So, for example, uh, south side of Chicago, there's a rap, there's King Vaughn, there's all that. I was into K-pop and anime and, <laughs> <laughs> and I love drawing and I love watching anime, as I said, and they saw that as not fitting in. Therefore, they outcasted me. So, yeah, that's what happened. And I realized that um, as I got into church, I realized and got to know people, I realized I wasn't alone, yeah. but it was more of those people who were around, they were too shy enough to end that black school to be able to, I wanna say, show off their interests. Therefore, they secluded themselves to be able to um, fit in, and I didn't want them to do that. So, That's yeah. That's a good word, thank you for sharing that. So there is a certain level of bravery that we have to address within ourselves to step outside of our social norms that That's we right. see every day. Uh, I'm proud of Anjali to be able just, just to withstand to come inside this environment, to stand here and to speak and to be open about herself. And we also gotta be brave with ourselves that inside of the, the realm, the people who are sitting next to, it's okay for us to be different. It's okay for us to have a different viewpoint. It's okay for us to speak the same language, eat the same food, shop at the same store, but walk down the aisle a little bit different. You know, anytime you go to the grocery store, you ain't got to walk, you can jog, you can dance, you can do something different. You can smile while you're here, you can cry openly. And it's okay to have that bravery to be open enough to cry and be just a little bit different. That's so I respect your, your individuality and your uniqueness. Okay. Good morning again. So my husband and I was watching this video together and at about 24 minutes in, I stopped it because I was struggling. He has said a few times, and I'm gonna paraphrase, how are people who don't look like me experiencing me? And he kept saying it, and he kept saying it. The first time he said it, I was like, oh, that is a nice phrase. I like that catchy phrase. He said it a, third, a second time, a third time, and then now my whole kingdom mindset privilege is on, and I'm hearing another separation. And I said to my husband, I said, he is saying, people who don't look like me, how are they experiencing me? And I said, that, that don't look like me is bothering me, because it's the, that don't look like me is the problem. Mm. The differences is the problem. The one thing that God created in us to connect us and to, to make us good is the very thing that's killing us, and it's our differences. Right. And wow. the fact that he kept saying that don't look like me, I said, that is also the problem. That cannot be also the solution. 
Because really and truly, you, you, look, you look just like me. In the, in the supernatural, you do. <laughs> in, in the supernatural, you do. In the spirit, you do. Physically, you don't, and that's fine. This is all dirt. Wow. But if you take that away, our spirits are still, still the same, made in the exact same likeness, in the exact same image from the exact same creator. And I struggled with it, because I'm like, oh, there's a part of me that wants to believe this, because I know they sent it out, it's supposed to be a video that we're supposed to agree with. But I'm like, hubby, I can't. I'm like, I don't, I, I, I cannot, because that is, in itself is a separation. And then my husband went on to talk about, because he's a police detective, who has seen a few autopsies in his day, and again, you split open the body, and you tear, op tear, you, you tear off and tear open that, out, that outer layer, Everything is the exact same. That's right. Your heart placement is the exact same where mine is. Your ribs are the exact same where mine is. It, mine may be a little bigger, but I mean, you know. Nonetheless, <laughs> it's still the exact same placement. The exact same placement. There's That's no right. color. Your blood is the exact same. Like, everything is the same. So when, you fo so when I'm forced to have to look at Dave, or have to look at Angela, or have to look at anyone because they are not physically looking like me, that is actually the one thing that I should be appreciating. Mm. Because if anything, it is the only difference that we have. I should be appreciating and, 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 and loving the fact that, okay, we look different on the outside, but on the inside, we, could, yeah. we, we are the same. How can we make this work? Yeah. What, what can we do? And so I struggled a little bit. That's good. Clap it up. So one quick apologetic point to further uh, you know, augment that. So I remember I was writing a, on my blog and I went to UVA, I, went, I graduated from University of Virginia. I, <laughs> and uh, 20, 2017, watching what happened there with the tiki torches and all was, was tough. And so I was writing, but in doing the research, point, uh, I forgot the man's name, but he's a geneticist, and he's like, 0.1% of our genetic makeup goes into determining your outside appearance. 0.1%. So what sense does it make to evaluate a person on the 99.9%, .9%, I mean, not on the 99.9%, .9%, but on the 0.1%, right? But we're, we're, we're taught that. Now, wouldn't it make sense if you're the enemy of God and God's goal is unity to insert things that are the precursors for disunity? Like if the church just looks at the wiles of the enemy with their eyes wide open, it makes perfect sense, the racial division, or at least how it's being propagated or put to us. But if God, Jesus' literal last prayer on earth before he was killed was that the church would be unified. And since that day and before that day, the, the attack of the enemy has been the exact opposite, which makes perfect sense. So we just need to have our eyes wide open. I thank Dave for Pastor, Pastor Dave having his eyes wide open and Pastor T to say, we see you, devil, and we're not going to let you win. So I want to provide opportunity for a couple questions, but one more question based on what Andy said. When he, when he gave us the way to solve, to how we love like Jesus loved, he said, you can't just be um, not racist yourself, but you need to be anti-racist. Um, how, how did that, and I think Alex, I called on you on that one. Um, how did that set with you, especially since that's now been politicized, anti-racism is such a political term. So I'll start and then... Um so I, I think most of you were here, I think maybe a few weeks ago when I was, I was preaching here. And um, the, so like as an apologist, or somebody who gives evidence for the faith, I actually speak against CRT a lot, have been doing so. Um, which I'm, I'm sure that's probably one of the things that some people were shocked to hear a black guy say when they came. Now it doesn't mean everything in that paradigm is false. It just means it can't be an overarching worldview. That being said, anti means to be against, racist. Is it good to be against racism? Of course, like there's nothing wrong with the term. The problem is this, culture has hijacked so many different words that they don't have the right to hijack. That's right. And so the church has to be bold and courageous and say no, 
That's ours. That's a God idea. Biblical justice is the only true justice. So when we speak justice, as long as we're speaking clear, clearly, it doesn't matter black or white, if we're saying what God has said. And so I, I've done, I have a YouTube channel, I've done shows, <laughs> like we, we talk, even when I push against CRT, I get called CRT. It's, it's crazy, I've been called a, a conservative and a liberal on the same day. <laughs> I, like I don't even, I mean people take one sound bite from you and that's, that's who you are. So that is, is done away with in relationship. Now, the, the, the culture has hijacked the anti-racist terminology to mean what they want it to mean, but the culture can't be biblical. That's right. By definition. So the church can't also bow out because then we cede that territory to the culture. So what Pastor Dave and Pastor T are doing, what we're doing now is saying, no, we're taking it back because that's how we redeem. The Bible is a book of redemption. This is how God redeems things from the culture that they've hijacked illegitimately so that they can be properly put in their place in the church. It's a good word. One of the things that was added there, and then, uh, well, we're going a little long, okay? I, I understand this is important, and so I want to get one more, but one of the things that um, we had talked about when we were all together was we can't always be for what we're against. We also must be what we're for, and what goes with the anti-racist is to carry one another's burdens. We must, we must be better at that. Here's the last question. One of the things Andy said in his, in his thing was that proximity is not friendship, um, can any of you speak to how important it is to engage relationally if we're going to fight justice, injustice? Pastor Dave, you just said something. I was talking to my brother, my husband, my, brother, brother. my husband in the car. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I don't know if you all heard what, Dave, what Pastor Dave just said. He said, you can't always be for what you're against. You have to be what you're for. And I was explaining to my husband, because I'm from the Bahamas, I'm from an island also where our number one industry is tourism. So even though mo most Bahamians are gonna be of the darker skin complexion, every day, all day, we're seeing and we're working with everybody else who's of some other color. We're also interacting with them, there's relationships, so we were used to that culturally, that's a part of who we are, that's a part of our history. So again, racism wasn't something that I, and then my generation as well, that I didn't experience. And I was explaining to him how the, one of the problems I think we're having with education is we're teaching the wrong thing as we go to anti-racism. And like we, should, we even shouldn't be teaching what racism, racism is or what we shouldn't do or how we should avoid it. Because that's the, or how we should be against it. We actually should be te teaching the only thing that my father taught me in my home. The only thing that, we, that, that I was taught in Sunday school the only thing that I was taught in school growing up was love. So we didn't, they didn't teach us about what racism was. They never, they never taught us about the opposite. They only taught us what love was. Because it was easy to, if I knew what love is, then I will automatically deduce what love isn't. You don't have to tell me that. You don't have to explain that to me. So they didn't waste time now talking about what even hate looks like. Let's talk about what love looks like, and let's waste time on that, or let's spend time on that, on what we are for, and then we wouldn't have to waste time on what we need to be against. And so that's how I grew up, and, that, and even to this very day. So when I first started racial uh, reconciliation, for the first couple of weeks, I was very shy to speak especially after hearing everybody's story, because everybody's story was the very opposite of mine. So if anything, I, didn't, I, I, I felt like I didn't belong in a circle where everybody has a racist story or racism experience background. I didn't have that. So I sat small in this group for a while and didn't say anything. And, and I then had she to... spoke. <laughs> 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 Can I just clear something up? Don't do it. Don't For do those it. of you Don't do it, Pastor T. who see black people within the black community, African American black community, you have divisions. You have colorism for those who are light, some who pass as white, and then you have African American, and then you have black. Teresa is a black woman who has not experienced an African American experience. 
So she comes with a great perspective for us, having not lived in a country that's predominantly black, who, who is the government, who runs everything, and people have money. I had recently had an experience with Haiti, and it wasn't until I was in Haiti that I understood Teresa's perspective mm -hmm. and learned to value that. So just so you guys know, we, even within our own race, we sometimes go like this. It's okay, sorry, Teresa, go ahead. No, he really was wondering what is wrong with this woman. I was, like, I was like, like what? <laughs> Where you, you don't even belong here. And I felt that way. And then I eventually started to tell myself and realize that your story or your life doesn't, or your experience doesn't have to be theirs. Why is that the way? Why can't you show them that there actually is another way? There is another way that, that, that you can be, and there's also a way where race, racism doesn't even have to be the narrative. It's not my narrative, and I refuse to accept it, so I was telling my husband in the car. Like, I've been refusing to accept everybody's narrative because it's not mine. However, having gone through school, having had friendships who are actually friends, not just in proximity, I'm able to understand. I'm able to have the conversation. I'm able to listen so I can empathize with them. So we can have a conversation where my non-experience of racism doesn't become a, well, you're different, so we can't, versus, yep. no, let's, let's have a conversation and let me give you a different perspective, or let me just share, share with, with you at that very moment. Wow. I'll just throw this on the fight. First of all, do we have any Marines here? All right, guess not. Any all Marines? Right. Marines, all right, Ura devil dog, but I was, <laughs> I was telling her, I said, I, I think like the idea of relationships and the idea of community or common unity, right, that will overshadow everything else. And I was telling her, I said, I remember going to the boot camp on the first day and they was like, they were very clear, listen, there's no black in here, there's no, everybody's green. Now you got some light green and you got some dark green, but everybody's green. And it, it is through the building of the relationships that you have with the people that you're working in proximity with, because at the end of the day, I'm depending on you, you depending on me to say, but I don't care what color you are, can you cover my six? <laughs> and so what happens is when you build relationships with people, then the exterior is minimized. At the end of the day, if you reduce everyone to a human being and operate from that perspective, then I think we're good to go. So we've run out of time. I would love to be able to do some question and answer. How many have some questions? Oh, good. We have a few. Um, feel free to come and ask. I would also say if you're interested in being part of something like this, come and talk to myself or Terrence. Here's what I would say, and we can stand in this moment. I, I wonder if our churches would be more diverse if our dinner tables were more diverse. I wonder. I wonder if we, if we put ourselves in not proximity, but in relationship with people that are different than us, celebrating those differences. Man, I learned stuff today. Did anybody else learn stuff today? Yeah. Um, let's, let's stop listening to the cultural narrative that's being sold to us. Turn the news off for a while. And, and let's listen to people that are in the midst of it. Grab any one of these folks and take them out to dinner and ask about the experience. It's powerful. Hey, take them out to dinner. You got that, right? <laughs> they would love that. Here's what I would read over us as we go. There is a kingdom of God that is the already but not yet. And so one day God is going to make all things new. That's the not yet. It's coming. But until then, Revelation 7, 9 gives us a picture of what's going to be that can be today. And I'll read this over you. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from every tribe, from every people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. This is not about us. This is always about him, has always been about him, will always be about him. And the best way we honor him is to honor each other. 
May we do that. And may we invite some people to our dinner table so we can learn. We love you. This has been a great series. Let's talk more and argue way less. Have a great week. Love you all.